Welcome everyone, it's Matmus. Thank you so much for joining me on this video today. So you have been requesting for this video for a very, very long time. We are going to talk to you today about the M1 Abrams main battle tank. It's different variants, it's overview, it's capabilities, it's stats, and finally my overview and slash personal opinion on the vehicle itself. So first of all, let's talk about a brief history of this amazing main battle tank. Abrams tanks currently exist in three basic variants. Notice how I said basic. The M1, M1A1, and M1A2. While they are very similar externally, each upgrade has brought major improvements. The original M1, with its 105mm gun, is now relegated to training, although many have been retrofitted to the M1A1 specification. These in fact constitute most of the Abrams tanks used today. The M1 developed was to replace the M60 series tank, a program that began in the late 1960s. At that time, Soviet armor developments, first the T-64 and then T-72, raised serious questions about the future survivability of the United States main battle tanks on the battlefield. The T-72, with its innovative 125mm cannon, low profile, high-tech sights and laser rangefinder, caused particular unease among NATO planners back in the day. The first proposed replacement was the MBT-70, a project whose cost and complexity caused a national scandal and affected the ear of the US Congress. A rather more austere program was authorized in December 1971 under the designation XM-1. The specification called, however, for a whole new level of both protection and mobility. Concerns over the potential costs led to several manufacturers being allowed to bid on the new design, a departure from standard procedure for the United States. The Chrysler Corporation prototype was selected for engineering development in November 1976. In 1979, approval was given for limited production, and in March 1982, Chrysler sold their tank division to General Dynamics. The XM1 project was hampered firstly by hysterical media, and thus political, overreaction to Israeli losses in 1973. Some commenters even claiming that the day of the tank itself was past. And guys, if you haven't checked out a video in the past uh, about my kind of opinion on whether or not tanks have still a future, go check it out. This ill-informed press campaign dragged on until the beginning of the 1980s. Meanwhile, there had also been some confused wrangling over a possible joint US-German MBT requirement. The first production M1 was completed at the Lima plant in Ohio in February 1980 and the new MBT was a type classified February 1981 as the M1 Abrams, named after General Creighton Abrams, who commanded the crack 37th Tank Battalion, 4th Armour Division in Europe in 1944-45. Deliveries of the first batch of production vehicles began in 1981. In 1982 to 83, the second armor division at Fort Hood, Texas, became the first formation to fully re-equip with the M1. By that time, the brilliant success of the M1s of the 64th Armored Regiment in the 1982 Reforger tactical exercise in Germany had already established its reputation as something revolutionary. The M1 was designed to defeat the T-72 and its whole family. As delivered, the M1 offered greatly superior armor. The British-designed Chobham Composite Armor Protection was placed onto this vehicle. The firepower was versatile, however, the M60A1 rifled 105mm gun was later superseded to the 120mm gun. One of the most interesting departures from the conventional tank design was the use of Textron Lycoming AGT 1500 gas turbine engine. Despite the howls of skeptics, this proved to offer major improvements over conventional diesel power plants, including greater range, higher top speed, roughly around 40 miles an hour, lower maintenance, and quieter running. The first revision to the M1, the M1 IP, or Improved Production Vehicle, had improved armor and added a bustle rack for non-critical stowage and an improved and redundant electrical bus, while retaining the 105mm cannon. The M1A1, developed from 1986, with deliveries beginning in 1991, boasted the Rheinmetall-designed M256 120mm cannon, an improved fire control system with separate thermal sights for the commander, a sophisticated hybrid MBC or nuclear, biological and chemical protection system, and improved suspension and armor. The addition of compartmentalized depleted uranium to the composite protected created the M1A1 HA heavy armor designation. 
This package represented a significant step forward. Both the US Army and Marine Corps used the M1A1 with great success in Operation Desert Storm. Units which shipped to Saudi Arabia from Germany had the M1A1 from the start, while those which came from the USA, except for the 3rd Armored Cavalry, still had the M1 or M1IP. Most of these were replaced by reserve infantry from Germany before the ground war began. A further leap forward in capability was achieved with the M1A2 specification. By 1994, a major internal overhaul added highly integrated computer systems, greatly improved target acquisition and superior communications. While the A1 is 90% analog and the A2 series is 90% digital, the A2 equipped with a hunter killer technology which allows the commander and gunner to simultaneously acquire and designate targets for the main gun. The tank commander can designate one target while the gunner is firing at another. As soon as the first is killed, the turret automatically swings into alignment with the second and the gunner is ready to fire almost instantly. At just a shade of under 65 tons in the A2, with a 1500 horsepower gas turbine and 4 speed automatic transmission, the Abrams can achieve a top speed of roughly 41 miles per hour, which is pretty damn fast on level terrain, or can potentially be even higher in some cases, and only slightly less in the bush. The 270 mile cruising range is more than adequate for most operations, however it has been noted the M1 Abrams fuel economy slash mileage is not exactly great when using a gas turbine engine. The hull of the Abrams is 30 feet long and 12 feet wide. From turret top to ground it measures a short 7 feet 9 inches. The M1 hull is carefully engineered to maximize efficiency and minimize battle damage. It is low with sharply angled front surfaces to deflect incoming rounds as much as possible. These do the job well. Even without the most advanced armor used in the front quadrant, the turret front and glasses plate. The M1 was originally fitted with the Chobham style composite armor, a steel and ceramic sandwich originally developed in Britain in the 1960s. To keep the fighting weight and composite armor down, it is only fitted over the front 60 degree arc and other sensitive locations. The remainder being protected by conventional rolled plate steel. Composite armor offers considerably greater protection and resistance and survivability than conventional rolled or cast armor. During Desert Storm, the M1's armor met all expectations, resisting anti tank guided weapons, kinetic energy, and chemical energy projectiles of more than 1900 Abrams in theater, only four were disabled, and only one of these by enemy action. The usual effect of hits from Iraqi gunners was according to one crewman, a scratch in the paint from a sabre round, or a small scorch from a heat shell. While some hits did penetrate the outer surface of the armour, leaving the M1's sabre rounds dramatically embedded in their hide, nothing the enemy really threw at them did much damage, even at close range. The upgrade to the M1A1 in 1988 added depleted uranium to the composite, greatly improving the M1's ability to withstand most anti-tank weapons. DU is 2.5 times denser than steel, while raising the overall weight of the M1 to 65 tons. The new armor significantly increased crew protection and survivability. One incident during the Gulf War testified that the Abrams durability, or the US Army's attempts to scuttle the disabled tank at close range, utterly failed. While US ammunition was capable of penetrating the armor and set off some of the ammunitions, the Halon fire suppression system <laughs> took over to save the tank from further damage. The driver's hole is centrally placed in the front of the hull with the turret locked in position. The driver's hatch swivels to the right and locks for entry on both open and closing for driving. Armour recruitment commercials to the contrary, you don't drive with the Abrams with the hatch open in any kind of tactical setting, is almost always buttoned up. The driver reclines almost prone in the adjustable seat under the turret drives and flanked by ammo and fuel storage from some of the electronics. In the rear hull, separated by an armoured bulkhead from the fighting compartment, are the fuel tanks and power pack, the AGT-1500 gas turbine engine and the Detroit diesel X113B transmission. An amazing 70% of the engine components can be removed without removing the engine or the entire assembly including transmission called the FUPP or full up power pack can be removed in roughly about an hour. Removing a handful of bolts and unsnapping the electrical connectors allows the FUPP to be slid out and the replacement unit slides right in. This is a major improvement over the diesel power plants of earlier tanks. Although the turbine itself is more complicated to work on, keeping the parts count to a minimum and ease of R&R &R unit level added up to a lot more downtime than the N1's predecessor. The Lycoming Textron AGT-1500 gas turbine engine is a major departure from old school diesel propulsion, 
Developing 1500 horsepower at 30,000 RPM, it is run at peak efficiency and road speed duties are delegated to the transmission. The AGT 1500 is a multi-fuel turbine engine. It can run on gas, diesel, aviation fuel, moose piss, eagle piss. It will literally run on anything. This means there are no pistons, rods or complex gear trains. It is lighter by almost a ton than conventional engines. It is a more reliable, emits less exhaust, can be faster, can be a lot quieter than a diesel and can start at minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit, which brings it into line with the Soviet equivalent. All this lasts up to a longer main battle tank, mean time between failures. The turbine runs at a constant RPM when above idle and as well as a result at maximum efficiency. It likes a lot of well filtered air though, not quite in the amounts of the diesel. During the early testing phase the M1s proved to be really needing extremely efficient air filters and seals as turbines are more sensitive to dust incursion than piston engines. Since the filtration issue was corrected, reliability has been excellent. The MTFFB has almost doubled to about 600 miles, tank total, not just the engine. With the arrival of the M1A2, its enhanced electronics came to the need of an auxiliary power unit. This allows the AGT 1500 power turbine to shut down while on prolonged halt, conserving fuel while the APU provides power to radios, electronics and battle systems. The turret houses the majority of the weapon systems and all of the crew except the driver in the fighting compartment. It therefore gets the lion's share of the DU armor. It is capable of rotating 42 degrees per second and tracking a target at 4.2 degrees per second. Elevation tracking speed is around 1.4 DPS to a maximum of 42 degrees. This means a full rotation in just over 8 seconds or accurately tracking a target moving at up to 40 miles per hour. The TC or tank commander sits high on the right hand side of the turret and has an independent stabilized day and night vision sight with a full 360 degree field of view in his hatch when closed. The gunner's position is also on the right hand side of the turret, forward of and below the commander. The loader sits below the commander to the left, separated from the gunner by the breech of the cannon, which is ready accessible to the ammunition storage racks in the bustle at the rear of the tank. The tank's radios are forward of the hull and his position, and mounted ahead of his hatch on the M1A2's roof is the CITV, or Commander's Independent Thermal Viewer. Most of the ammunition storage for the main armament is in the rear turret compartment, equipped with a powered blast door held by a closed dead man switch, operated by the loader's knee. Armoured panels in the bustle roof are designed to blow off upwards and backwards in case of an explosion in the ammunition compartment, rather than allowing for the explosion to vent forward into the fighting compartment. The older M1 series of tanks carries 55 rounds of 105mm rounds, 44 in the bustle rack, of which 22 can be reached without leaving the loader's seat. Eight of the remaining rounds are carried in the hull behind the engine bulkhead, and three in the turret to the left of the cannon. The changeover from 105mm to 120mm main armament brought a new case. The 105mm shells have a full length aluminum case. The 120mm case is self-consuming except for a short base stub. Although the 120mm rounds are considerably larger, the weight for both is about the same at close to around 50 pounds. The M1A1 and M1A2 carry 40 rounds of 120mm ammunition. There are 34 in the turret bustle and 6 in the rear hull box. The compartment doors blow off panels were also modified. The fire control system is one of the more innovative aspects of the M1. The combination of the power turret and two-stage magnification for day or night uses make the rapid target acquisition firing more stable. While the gunner ordinarily has a fully automatic system available, if things do go break down, he can go manual and input all major functions if possible. The tank commander and gunner share two main sighting systems, the gunner's primary sight, line of sight, or GPS and LOS, and has daylight optics for times 10 and 3 times field of view. The gun has two axis stabilization, keeping the gun pointed precisely at the target despite the movement of the tank. The gunner's field of view is somewhat limited to 120 degrees, so communication with the tank commander is important for target acquisition. With 360 degree field of view and control overrides, the tank commander can either acquire and or fire at a target or delegate to the gunner. For night use and in dusty or smoking conditions, the A1 and M1A2 are equipped with thermal imaging sites, otherwise known as TIS. The TIS reads the temperature differences between objects in the field of view. This data is displayed in the gunner's eyepiece, along with distance to target info from the laser rangefinder. 
The TAS combined with the two axis sight stabilization allows target acquisition under extreme conditions at much longer ranges than previously known. Neither night, dust storm or chemical smoke screens can prevent the gunner from acquiring his target, although fire control systems are extremely expensive, representing about 10% of the total cost of the tank. They proved a real war winner though for the Gulf War, and a program of further improvement in this is in the works with the M1A3 potential upgrades. Each sight system is protected from incoming by its own set of blast doors. As mentioned before, the M1's main gun is the rifled 105mm M68 based on the British L7A1 tube and the American T254E tube breech assembly. This cannon requires low maintenance and is highly accurate up to around 2,500 meters and can handle a variety of projectiles. The M1A1 and M1A2 mount the smooth board 120mm M256 effective up to around 3,000 meters. The two main types of projectiles are the chemical energy round, shape charge round, and the kinetic energy penetrators. The CE rounds are referred to as heat rounds or high explosive anti-tank. These deliver a tightly focused explosive charge penetrating through armor plate on the enemy vehicle. Heat rounds travel somewhat slower than the Sabo with a higher trajectory. Kinetic energy rounds comprise of a thin rod of tungsten or DU encased in a Sabo to fit for the bore of the cannon and this breaks away after the projectile leaves the muzzle. Fired from an unrifled tube, the projectile does not spin and requires small fins to stabilize its flight. Hence, armored piercing, fin stabilized discarding Sabo or APFSDS. One M240 7.62mm machine gun is coaxially mounted on the right hand side of the main gun and shares the gunner's primary sight or GPS and the gunner's auxiliary sight, gas. A second M240 is scape mounted on the loader's hatch with around 11,400 rounds of 7.62 can be carried. The M240 features three controlled rates of fire, 650 to 950 round cyclic, 200 RPM rapid fire and sustained rate of fire of 100 RPM. Firing more than 200 RPM may cause the gun to overheat. Weighing in at 24 pounds, the M240 has a maximum effective range of just over a mile, very effective at suppressing troops or engaging small targets. One M250 caliber 12.7mm Browning heavy machine gun with 3 times magnification sight is fitted on a power traverse, manually elevated mount ahead of the commander's cupola. This classic World War II era design is belt fed, recoil operated and air cooled and is highly effective against thin skin vehicles, personnel and aircraft, and potentially some APCs. It can be aimed and fired manually or remotely from under armour in the M1A2, and it is fitted with a solenoid trigger mechanism, replacing the more difficult mechanical trigger used on earlier models. As produced by Seiko Defense, it weighs 84 pounds plus mount and fires 550 RPM, and has a maximum effective range of 2,000 meters, about a mile and a quarter. 1,000 rounds are carried. A six barrel M250 smoke discharge is mounted on either side of the turret of the M1 and M1A1. An additional cluster has been seen centrally mounted above the main gun on some A2s. Despite its achievements, the Abrams has been criticized for its size and weight. At almost 70 tons, the tank has proven difficult to transport by air into foreign combat zones. It is incapable of crossing most bridges that are out today. The US Army hopes to rectify these problems with the new M1A3 version of the Abrams, which is planned to be lighter and more maneuverable than previous generations. The US Army has said it wants to upgrade the Abrams' internal computer systems. Estimates have determined that the current computer cabling in the tank could be replaced with state-of-the-art fiber optic cable and reducing the weight by around 2 tons. Currently in its design phase, the US Army plans to have prototypes built for the Abrams generations that are coming out today, known mainly as the M1A3. If the design and development phases proceed smoothly, the new Abrams are supposed to be deployed and ready by 2017 to 2018. Army officials have said they plan to keep the upcoming 4th generation Abrams tank in service until 2050. The M1A3 Abrams will be outfitted with a number of enhancements over the previous versions of the tank. To make the next version lighter and more mobile, the Army plans to replace the M256 smoothbore gun with a lighter 120mm cannon, although this is not set in stone as of right now. They are also going to add road wheels and improve suspension system to try and produce more lightweight systems on the road and running gear, and install a more durable track. Use lighter armour and insert precision armaments capable of hitting targets from 12km. 
Preliminary plans also call for the additional of an infrared camera and laser detector system, which are already found on the Abrams, and we do have systems that can be placed on the vehicles, but they're going to try and upgrade them. So guys, there you have it. The M1 Abrams tank from birth to its new, I guess, revitalized history that will soon be starting for the M1A3 series. Guys, let's be honest here, I, I would determine this tank for the United States military and, and other militaries around the world is an iconic tank. It's kind of what I would relate to as similar to the M60, which is pretty much what this vehicle was designed to replace back in the old days. It's an iconic American muscle tank, we know it, it's, it's shown everywhere, whether it be in the media, or in shows, movies, whatever it may be, we see it all over the place, and most people know what this tank is, um, it, you know, if you have not any common sense about you in terms of military talk. There's a lot of speculation as to, you know, uh, what's going to happen with this M1A3 upgrade, and I'm very curious myself, you know, how's it going to run? Is America eventually going to design its own new tank and try and keep up with the uh, design and procurement phase that different countries are trying to do right now? Who knows? What I will say is this tank is definitely still able to keep up for the future. It has all the capabilities that we know most modern day battle tanks need and have. Um, clearly enough firepower, its protection and armament uh, is concurrently being upgraded. The armor packages are obviously a little subjective, we're not too sure exactly what's going to go on with them. Um, but it's highly impressive, I mean, to me personally, the Abrams is one of those vehicles that has, again, been highly battle tested. It's been all over the world doing various different tasks uh, and combat environments, whether it be in Iraq, um, you know, all over the place, and even if in Afghanistan. Um, now, the problem with the Abrams right now is it's getting a lot of rap because of its deployment in Iraq. Now, I would like to first of all apologize. There was a video I did in the past um, about the usefulness of tanks in their future, and I mentioned that uh, M1 Abrams were placed in Syria, uh, given to the uh, Syrian forces there. That is obviously incorrect. I meant to say Iraq and the Iraqi Defense Forces there are trying to take back their country, I guess. Uh, they have been deployed there, and obviously they are not the same or comparable armor features or uh, tank features that the Abrams that we have in the NATO world, because they're not going to give out their, you know, best equipment to countries um, in that environment. So, with that being said, the Abrams are getting a lot of rap right now because of the fact there's a lot of footage being taken of Abrams being hit by anti-tank guided missiles in Iraq. Now, this is a very touchy subject and one which I don't really want to get too deep on, but at the end of the day, you have to remember that the vehicles that have been given to these countries have been given probably the lowest armor rated package that these vehicles can come with. Um, and you can't really give the Abrams too much of a hit for that because you can't say, well, Abrams got knocked out in Iraq by an anti-tank guided missile, then that means they're absolutely crap elsewhere. No, that's not really the case, and we can't really state that. Um, Unfortunately, it tends to come from people who are very biased, and that's obviously going to be the case. I'm not saying, though, at the same instance, that these anti-tank guided missiles couldn't penetrate the new armor of these vehicles that are out nowadays, but we need to take things like that with a pinch of salt. These tanks are still very highly capable in the combat environments that they've been placed in today, and I can see it in the near future to the long future that these vehicles are going to continue putting uh, rounds down range and punching through armor and supporting, you know, every other combat arms are out there, whether it be infantry or combat engineers, etc, etc. Uh, they are the spearhead, the tip of the spear for most uh, engagements, and it's nice to see the Abrams is still coming on form, doing its job. Uh, you're seeing it all around the world right now, both in, in Poland, there's a very large training area there, I, in fact I trained there myself. You're seeing the Abrams working with the Leopard 2s and Challenge 2s. And just absolutely fantastic seeing our NATO brothers working together and, and getting these tanks rolling and practicing what they may potentially and hopefully never need to use in the future. Um, but yeah, guys, I'd really like to hear your opinion on this tank. It's one of those tanks that, okay, you know, there's a lot of heated discussion and I'd prefer it if you just try and keep it low-key. Don't start fighting out in the comments. At the end of the day, guys, they're just tanks. Um, but yeah, let me hear your opinions on it, and, and your opinions on the video. If there's something you disagree with, or that is wrong, please correct me. I will put it in the description, or try and link it in the video as kind of a layover. Um, and I do apologize if there is bad information there. I tried my best to use as many uh, resources as I could and cross-reference, so I hope I hit the nail on the head here. And I know this is a tank that you know I didn't want to drop the ball on. Um, but I really do appreciate you watching today. Please, please, please leave a like, and uh, if you're new to my channel, please subscribe. And stay tuned for more armored fighting vehicle videos in the near future.